everything from fighter jets to ICBMs, aircraft carriers and unmanned platforms, stealth planes, special operations and everything in between. Let us dive into the history and achievements of military technology in this episode of Mill Power. September 3rd, 2013. The skies over Estonia. Two flights of four SU-35 Flanker E's cruise at 40,000 feet, sweeping the airspace in an effort to secure air superiority. 20 years after the Black Brand scare went hot, the tensions between the United States and Russia have boiled over. Attempting to flex her muscle, the Russian bear now proclaims no-fly zones over claimed territories of quote, Russian heritage. A few weeks prior, a Russian SU-27 flew into an unmanned MQ-9 drone, crashing it into the Black Sea, and two SU-35s were scrambled to divert a U.S. Air Force RC-135 Rivet Joint Reconnaissance Aircraft off the coast of the Aleutian Islands. Now, U.S. aircraft are on high alert, yet the rules of engagement state they cannot engage unless fired upon first. The A Flakers detect four aircraft over the horizon. A flight of F 15 CE perform a combat air patrol mission. Without warning, two of the SU 35s fire, launching long range R 77s, forcing the Eagles to defend. Dropping 15,000 feet in a matter of seconds, they descend into the thicker air to rob the missiles of their energy and release chaff to fool the weapons' radar. The F 15 pilots, having just barely survived the attack, Turn back for home. 40,000 feet above them, streaks four contrails, moving east at nearly twice the speed of sound. Roughly 75 miles away, the flankers push the attack, accelerating when one of the aircraft suddenly turns sharp, descends, then erupts into a ball of flames. Then another, and another, and another. Quickly, the remaining flankers scatter, breaking off in all different directions. Dumping chaff and chaos ensues over the radios. None see enemy aircraft on their instruments. And they can't tell where the missiles are coming from. The survivors turn tail and accelerate back towards the Russian border, not knowing if their aircraft is the next to explode. From the ground, people in the Estonian countryside can see the four contrails high in the clouds and hear a sonic boom as they tear across the sky. Those four streaks? a flight of stealthy F-22A Raptors. They had been flying behind and above the Eagles, silently tracking the hostile flight of SU-35s. An all-out air war has broken out over Eastern Europe, and the many Raptors stationed at NATO bases around the continent helped turn the tide, establishing air supremacy in the coming days. Thankfully, this is nothing more than an exercise of alternate history. Yet the scenario helps demonstrate the overwhelming advantage the world's first fifth generation fighter provides. In today's episode of the Millpyro series, we will review the King of the Skies, its origins, traits, specifications, and future. Before we begin, I must define a few important concepts, aircraft generations, and aerial supremacy. First, we'll cover the degrees of air control. The concept defines the level of control a combatant possesses in any given airspace. The lowest level, aerial parity, means neither side has a true control over the airspace. At this point, ground forces naval vessels, and airborne assets on both sides are equally vulnerable to aircraft and air operations are likely undertaken by either stealth aircraft or high-level air-to-air fighters. Next level up is a favorable air situation, 
meaning control of the airspace is not sufficient enough to where the enemy air force will have a more difficult time affecting Allied operations. Above this is air superiority. Here, an Allied campaign can have more freedom of movement and operation without interference from enemy aircraft. The highest level is air supremacy. When an Allied force possesses air supremacy, they have a total control of the skies. The enemy is essentially unable to operate in that airspace. A good example of air supremacy would be the skies of Iraq during the 1991 Gulf War after the initial air campaign. The two highest degrees of air control are essential for American battle planning. So much so that the United States has built some of the best air superiority fighters over the decades and spent an exorbitant amount of funding on maintaining that edge. In fact, a big point of pride for the U.S. Air Force is that no American ground troop has been killed by enemy aircraft since April 15, 1953, during the Korean War. Now, let's define fighter generations and how each subsequent level surpasses their predecessors. Be aware, everyone has different interpretations and lines in the sand for what planes belong in what generation. Yet, here in this video, we are using my personal definitions. First generation fighters were the originators of jet powered flight. The grandfather of them all was the Messerschmitt ME-262, the world's first jet powered fighter aircraft. The biggest advantage this generation delivered over piston aircraft of the day was speed. While the US Army Air Force's main line propeller driven fighter, the legendary P-51D Mustang, Topped out at 440 miles per hour, the ME-262 could reach a max speed of 560 miles per hour. Other members of the Grandfather's Club are the British Gloucester Meteor, the American F-80 Shooting Star, F-86 Sabre, and Soviet MiG-15. Key characteristics of this generation are the lack of avionics and reliance on guns as their primary armament. The successors to the old-timers arrived during the Korean War. Marked by the advent of air-to-air -air missiles and better avionics, second-generation fighters represented a massive technological leap to the air forces they were in service with. The design philosophy of early Cold War fighters was that of fast-moving, nuclear-armed planes that could fly behind enemy lines to strike and rapidly leave the area. As aircraft became faster, it became apparent that in aerial combat, guns alone just wouldn't cut it, prompting the introduction of guided missiles. Examples of this generation include the F-102 Delta Dagger and the MiG-21 Fishbed. The arrival of third generation fighters saw the technology introduce any prior family of aircraft mature and develop, pushing missile ranges out beyond the horizon along with new avionics to utilize these weapons were hallmarks of this series of fighters. Large Doppler radars enable look down shoot down capabilities, allowing a high flying fighter to scan the airspace beneath them, not only tracking low-flying enemies, but also cruise missiles. Another major indicator of this generation, the introduction of more dedicated mixed-use aircraft such as fighter bombers when compared to the strictly air-to-air -air roles the majority of first and second gen planes fulfilled. Members of the Gen 3 Club are the F-4 Phantom, F-5 Tiger, and MiG-25 Foxbat. Later aircraft of this generation would see the introduction of the first afterburning turbofan engines aboard the F-111 Aardvark, a major leap in power and efficiency over the older turbojet technology. These new types of power plant would make their way onto nearly every military aircraft in service, from cargo to fighters to bombers. Fourth generation fighters would be marked by a radical advancement in avionics improved weapons technology, and refined aerodynamics. This era would also see a design philosophy change, from raw speed to maneuverability. Some of the most iconic fighters of all time are in this generation. The F-14 Tomcat, SG-27 Flanker, F-15 Eagle, MiG-29 Falcon, F-16 Fighting Falcon, and F-A-18 Hornet. Within the 4th gen tree are branches experts describe as 4 plus gen aircraft. 
These are fourth generation planes that possess more advanced features, capabilities, and avionics that separate them from conventional fourth generation fighters. Jets in this in-between category may have a variable combination of advanced sensor fusion, AESA radars, super crew, or supersonic cruising without afterburner, or reduced radar cross-sections. The FA-18 Super Hornet, EF-2000 Eurofighter Typhoon, SU-35 Flanker E, F-15EX Eagle II, Dassault Rafale, and Saab Gripen are all a part of this division. Finally, we get to the new kids on the block, the fifth generation fighters. These jets represent the cutting edge of military aviation, being far and away the most capable, lethal, and survivable combat aircraft on the planet. The main attributes of this family are low observability, or stealth, advanced integrated avionics, and sensor fusion capabilities. Members of this exclusive club include the F-35 Lightning II, SU-57 Felon, J-20 Mighty Dragon, and of course, the F-22A Raptor. During the early 1980s, it became apparent that America's edge in air dominance was waning. New Soviet-built fighters such as the MiG-29 and SU-27 Flanker had closed the gap with the U.S. Air Force's F-15 Eagle and F-16 Fighting Falcon. Advancements in Warsaw Pact air defense systems meant survivability of Allied aircraft over contested airspace would be greatly diminished. Neither the Eagle or Fighting Falcon had been in service long by the time these revelations were made. The F-15 entered service in January 1976 while the F-16 came online in August 1978. The rapid improvement of Russian aircraft and anti-air systems required a new, advanced fighter that would not only outclass anything flying or projected, but could also evade Soviet counter-air capabilities. The United States Air Force would put forward a formal requirement for an advanced tactical fighter, ATF, in 1981, with the project team becoming the System Program Office in 1983. Over the coming years, the requirement for the ATF would develop into a request for a fighter that can supercruise up to Mach 1.4, has a 50,000 pound maximum takeoff weight, and a combat radius of 800 miles. Simultaneously, the Joint Advanced Fighter Engine Program would launch, searching for suitable power plants to propel the upcoming modern fighter. Engine manufacturers Pratt & Whitney and General Electric would go on to receive contracts for the program in September 1983. In response to the ATF request, McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed, Northrop, Boeing, and General Dynamic submitted proposals. In October 1986, two designs would be selected to move forward in the ATF competition, Lockheed's and Northrop's. Both companies had extensive success building and testing fighters. Lockheed had been delivering aircraft to the Air Force for so long, their first fighter jet, the P-80 Shooting Star, entered service in 1945, when the Air Force was still part of the United States Army. The company also birthed the F-94 Starfire, the F-104 Starfighter, the C-130 Hercules, U-2 Dragon Lady, SR-71 Blackbird, F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the F-117 Nighthawk the world's first operational stealth aircraft. Meanwhile, Northrop was founded in 1939 and created the P-61 Black Widow, F-89 Scorpion, F-5 Tiger, YF-17, which later became the F-A-18, and the Tacit Blue, an experimental stealth technology demonstrator. With both Lockheed and Northrop having an experience building and flying low observable aircraft, their design teams went to work to create fighters that would meet the ATF program's requirements. The end results? Lockheed's YF-22, originally given the unofficial nickname Lightning II, after the company's P-38 of World War II, and Northrop's YF-23, affectionately named Black Widow II, claiming lineage after the P-61 of the same war.
As the ATF reached the latter days of the competition, two advanced prototype fighters and a pair of revolutionary experimental engines would take center stage. There would be two of each fighter built, one pair powered by GE's YF-120 engine, while the others would sport Pratt & Whitney's YF-119. Due to the performance requirements placed by the Air Force and the hardware needed to meet them, the estimated gross weight of the aircraft designs rose to 60,000 pounds. To compensate for this increase, the target thrust output was raised to 35,000 pounds per engine. GE's YF-120 was a cutting-edge piece of hardware. Unlike their competitor's engine, which was a fixed bypass after burning turbofan, the YF-120 was a variable cycle engine, or VCE. VCEs are unique as they automatically alternate airflow inside the power plant to meet the pilot's input. So if the plane is at a high altitude and cruising, the engine will bypass more air for better fuel efficiency. But if the pilot throws the throttle to full afterburner, the airflow would then reroute into the center of the turbine to provide better thrust. The bypassing cooler air can also be utilized for thermal mitigations. It can be pumped directly into the exhaust or even cool the aircraft itself. General Electric would also fit a 12% larger fan to the engine to increase overall airflow. On top of this, the engine had fewer parts than the YAF-119, while weighing only 5% heavier. All of these factors combined to make the YF-120 the superior engine in testing. Of the four prototype aircraft, the pair with the YF-120 demonstrated higher performance capabilities. For example, the YF-23 with Pratt & Whitney's engine would reach a supercruise speed of Mach 1.43 while the Black Widow sporting GE's VCE was recorded cruising at Mach 1.6. The YF-22 prototype with the same engine would reach a cruising speed of Mach 1.5. Speaking of experimental fighters, how do they compare? On paper, the Black Widow was the better aircraft. Northrop leaned heavily on their experience designing the new B-2 Spirit, and lessons learned during the U.S. Air Force's lightweight fighter program when their YF-17 design lost to the eventual F-16 Fighting Falcon. Yet even in this defeat, Northrop gained a victory as their design would birth the F-A-18 Hornet. These learning moments, experiences, and use of modern computers and advanced design techniques help Northrop create an extraordinarily capable aircraft. The Black Widows were not only faster than the YF-22s, but they were also stealthier. And as mentioned earlier, aircraft sporting GE's YF-120 engines displayed superior performance. In order to save weight, Northrop elected against using thrust vectoring nozzles instead of utilizing a sunken exhaust design and placing special handcrafted heat dispersing tiles and nozzles to better dissipate infrared energy. To achieve enhanced levels of maneuverability without thrust vectoring controls, the YF-23 prototypes featured an advanced moving V-tail design. They were canted 50 degrees outwards and the entire tail moved as a control surface for pitch, roll, and yaw. That specific angle was chosen to avoid acute angles that would cause radar returns during maneuvering. Combining the large V-tail and the aircraft's other flight control surfaces allowed the Black Widow exceptional high angles of attack. The YF-23 featured a large internal weapons bay with space for a complement of four AM-120 Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air -air Missiles, or AMRAMs. As a cost-saving measure, the prototypes featured modified main landing gear of a F-A-18 Hornet, while the nose gear was from an F-15 Eagle and parts of the cockpit were from a Strike Eagle. As both engines in the program were capable of 35,000 pounds of thrust and the aircraft had a gross weight of roughly 51,000 pounds, this prototype fighter had a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.36 to 1. 
Combine this with a sleek airframe and refined aerodynamics, and you're dealing with an aircraft with phenomenal acceleration and high speed. Though the aircraft's top speed is still top secret to this day, it is speculated that the YF-23 with GE's YF-120s could push upwards of Mach 2.2, likely limited by the damage air friction would cause to the ram coating. The first YF-23, Prototype Air Vehicle 1, or PAV-1, Air Force Serial Number 87-0800, painted in the iconic dark gray with a red-black widow hourglass on the bottom of the fuselage, first took flight on the 27th of August 1990 with test pilot Alfred Hall Metz at the controls. Northrop's executive leadership would demand the removal of the logo soon afterwards. Black Widow PAV-2, Air Force Zero number 87-0801, would join the flight program on the 26th of October that same year. Lockheed was no pushover in the military aviation space. This wouldn't be a walk in the park for the Northrop team and their YF-23. Lockheed's legendary Advanced Development Projects Division, better known as Skunk Works, were responsible for many black aviation projects during the Cold War. Here are a few of those iconic designs. The U-2 Dragon Lady High Altitude Reconnaissance Plane was operated by both the U.S. Air Force and CIA. The U-2 first flew in 1955, entered service in 1956, and still flies today. You have the legendary SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest and highest flying manned air-breathing jet aircraft ever built. First taking flight in 1964 and joining the CIA and US Air Force in 1966, the Blackbird was a long-range strategic reconnaissance aircraft that could fly at an absurd 85,000 feet and cruise it up to Mach 3.2 or 2,200 miles per hour. A great example of the brilliance at work to build the Blackbird is that since the aircraft was more than 90% titanium and the metal was costly, hard to use, and rare, new manufacturing processes had to be designed from scratch and some of these techniques are still used in today's modern aviation. The Blackbird was also an early attempt at reducing an aircraft's radar signature. Finally, we have the F-117 Nighthawk, the world's first true operational stealth aircraft, which first flew in 1981 and entered service in 1983. This aircraft program was shrouded in secrecy, with much of it still classified. Lockheed would lean heavily on this experience and the team's iconic successes to field a highly capable ATF demonstrator. The first YF-22, PAV-1, Air Force serial number 87-0700, would be rolled out two days after the Black Widow's first flight and first ascended into the heavens on the 29th of August, 1990. While the YF-23 was both faster and stealthier than Lockheed's design entry, the Lightning had superior maneuverability thanks to the inclusion of thrust vectoring. One key difference between Northrop and Lockheed's flight test series was that the latter performed live fire missile launches of AIM-9 Sidewinders and AIM-120 AMRAMs from the internal weapons base. The second YF-22, PAF-2, Air Force Serial Number 87-0701, joined the Lightning Flight Team on the 30th of October, 1990. A total of 74 flight tests would occur between the two teams' prototypes by the time the ATF flying program terminated in December 1990. So, we met our competitors, measured their strengths and weaknesses, saw the background of their companies, and where the teams drew their experience from. Northrop went for a faster, stealthier design, seeking an aircraft that could soar high, cruise fast, and strike without warning. Lockheed, on the other hand, focused on a stealth platform that could also attack without detection, while flying at altitude and supercruise, yet placed a larger emphasis 
or within visual range dogfights. So, who would win this competition to become America's next generation air dominance fighter? On paper, this is an easy win for the Black Widow too. Following the flight test phase, both contractor teams submitted their Engineering and Manufacturing Development, or EMD, proposals for full-scale production, seeking the ATF contract. The outcome of the competition would come on the 23rd of April 1991, when Secretary of the Air Force Donald Rice would announce the YF-22 as the winner. There has been a lot of speculation over the years as to why the Black Widow 2 was not selected. Reasons range from the YF-22 having better mobility to Northrop's mishandling of the B-2 Spirit procurement. Personally, I believe it was a combination of multiple factors. The Spirit program's cost overruns, the YF-22 performing missile launch tests, while the YF-23 did not, Lockheed's use of PR buzzwords and advanced flying maneuvers compared to Northrop's use of more technical terminology and relying on raw data along with the Air Force's focus on maneuverability since the end of the Vietnam War, starting with the F-15 Eagle. The Joint Advanced Fighter Engine Program will conclude in August 1991, awarding the contract to Pratt & Whitney's YF-119. Now, you may ask, I thought both prototypes powered by the YF-120s outperformed Pratt & Whitney's entry. How did the lesser engine win? Simple answer? Complexity and risk. While GE's power plant provided enhanced capabilities, primarily in acceleration, top speed, and cruising velocity, the engine's design was very risky. The highly advanced turbine was a very complex piece of engineering. The concept of an adaptive engine had massive upsides, yet also presented an enormous risk if the unproven technology failed after years of operation or a flaw arose later in production. The YF-19 was seen as a safer bet for slightly diminished performance capabilities. Lockheed Martin submitted EMD design would evolve into a very familiar shape. From here, the YF-22 Lightning II transforms into the F-22A Raptor, and the King of the Skies would come into its own. A few key engineering decisions would go into molding the prototype YF-22 Lightning II into the F-22A Raptor we know today. For starters, to increase pilot visibility outside the cockpit, the canopy was moved forward, while the air intakes were moved more to the rear and the frame design was simplified, putting the pilot in a high visibility island atop the aircraft. The nose section that contains the radar, known as the radome, was redesigned, the shape providing both superior stealth and radar performance. The wing sweep angle was reduced from 48 to 42 degrees, while the wing span increased from 43 feet to 44 and a half feet, improving overall agility, and the wing shape was revised to account for additional avionics. Wind tunnel tests would result in the vertical and horizontal stabilizers being redesigned. The horizontals would be larger, while the verticals would shrink down to improve agility and stealth. The mid-air refueling receptacle was reconfigured, and the overpressure bypass vents were moved slightly. The main landing gear changed from forward retracting to side retracting to save weight and space while the side weapons bay was moved aft. The ailerons flaperons and leading edge flaps were also updated. The internal structure of the wing, particularly where it attaches to the fuselage, was revamped and strengthened. The doors on the main weapons bay were changed from a bifold to single fold design, making them simpler with fewer potential points of failure. Finally, the shape and contour of the thrust vectoring nozzles were refined reducing weight while maintaining the stealth capabilities. These adjustments took the aircraft from a flight test prototype to a stealthy airborne predator. 
this Hunter of the Skies would be unveiled to the public on the 9th of April, 1997, at the Lockheed Martin Marietta facility, and the Air Force officially designated the new stealth fighter as the Raptor. Named the Spirit of America, F-22 Air Force Zero Number 91-4001 represented the new pinnacle of combat aviation and would first take flight on the 7th of September, 1997. At the controls of the fighter, Lockheed Martin's chief test pilot, Alfred Paul Metz. Yes, the exact same Paul Metz who took the YF-23 Black Widow 2 for his first flight only seven years prior. Paul Metz is the only person to have flown both ATF fighter designs. The aircraft was given the call sign of Raptor 01 for the flight. Departing Dobbins Air Reserve Base in Marietta, Georgia, Metz would fly the aircraft for just under an hour and reach an altitude of 20,000 feet. The pair of F-16 chase planes experienced trouble keeping up with the Raptor as its rate of climb exceeded expectations. During the flight, Metz tested the fighter's engine output settings, landing gear cycling, and formation flying qualities. Starting in 1998, the Raptor's flight test and validation program would transfer to Edwards Air Force Base, California and be taken over by the 411th Flight Test Squadron, also known as the Raptor Combined Test Force. Unlike previous fighter development programs, the flight test program team was closely integrated with the design team from the inception of the Raptor Combined Test Force. Testing instruments were incorporated into the nine engineering and manufacturing development Raptors built for the 111th Flight Test Squadron. Aircrafts 4001 through 4009 would join the CTF between 1998 and 2004, pushing the limits of the airframe's design and unveiling some truly remarkable capabilities. The CTF had a single goal, to determine if this new fighter could do everything it promised. The testing regiment would cover all capable altitudes, speeds, and G-loads. Raptor 4001 would make its first flight at Edwards on the 17th of May, 1998, signifying the formal beginning of the flight test process. A few months later, on July 30, the same F-22 would partake in an hour and a half long mission with the KC-135 Stratotanker, testing the safe limits of operations for midair refueling. Her flight career would end in 2000 when she was transferred to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio for live fire damage tests. Raptor 4002, nicknamed Old Reliable, rejoined the flight program in late August 1998, being flown to Edwards from Marietta by then Director of Operations for the 411th Flight Test Squadron, Major Stephen Hooter Rainey. The four and a half hour cross country flight demonstrated the endurance of the platform. After the flight, Major Rainey stated, it is the best flying aircraft I have flown, and it sets a new standard of excellence in fighter aviation. A pillar of the Raptor program, Major Rainey flew one of the chase planes that followed Paul Metz's F-22 during the Raptor's first flight. He also performed the first midair refueling in the jet, first to fly cross country, and was the first active duty U.S. Air Force pilot to fly the new stealth fighter. Aircraft 4002 would be utilized for testing high angles of attack and weapon launches from the internal weapon space. Internal weapon testing took place on the ground, ejecting AIM-120s from the main bay, while also jettisoning tanks and pylons stored on the wings. The fighter would be transferred to Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida as a ground instructional training unit. Aircraft 4003 joined the CTF in March 2003 and was unique being the first F-22 with the internal structure of a full production Raptor. This allowed the fighter to be utilized for tests requiring a 100% maximum load. It would also be the first aircraft to operate the internal M61 A2 Vulcan cannon. However, it would only stay with the program for just under a year. On the 28th of September 2004, Raptor 4003 will undertake a flight test with two external tanks during which the airframe would be overstressed. After passing through the wake of an F-16, flight control software errors caused the aircraft to lose control. 
though the maximum allowed G limit for this flight with a pair of bags on the fighter was listed at just over 7 G. The pilot pulled 11.7 Gs to recover. The aircraft landed safely yet never flew again. While the earliest EMD Raptors flew test flight characteristics and weapons testing, the brains of the F-22 was flying on board a modified Boeing 757 flying test bed. The avionics would be refined before flying on Raptor 4004, the first F-22 containing all of the sensors needed to locate, target, and shoot enemy aircraft. From this point on, all subsequent entries from 4005 to 4009 will be flown by the CTF, performing various tests ranging from weapons, speed, altitude, and G-forces. Today, even after the F-22 entered service in 2005, Raptors 4006, 4007, 4009 are still flying with the 411th Flight Test Squadron, testing new capabilities and sharpening the teeth of the ultimate predator of the skies. To be continued. Next time, we'll continue the Raptor story, covering its stealth, maneuverability, avionics, weaponry, speed, future, struggle, tragedies, and challengers. Hail the F-22 Raptor the king of the skies. <laughs> <laughs>